Good evening everyone, I'm Doc Apocalypse and you're watching Apocalypse MTG. Today we'll be covering all the enchantment sagas of Kamigawa Neon Dynasty. Quick self-promotion, if you would hit the like and subscribe button real quick. YouTube has stopped pushing notifications for new videos from your subscriptions, so there's no real harm in hitting that sub button. But for me, it's going to make a world of difference and it'll help me get one step closer to my goal of breaking that 1,000 subs. So thank you very much. With all that out of the way, let's go over how I'm going to break these down. First, let's go over each saga in Wooburg order, so we know what we are dealing with. For those of you that are newer to magic, Wooburg is also known as Color Pie. White, blue, black, red, and green. There's not much meaning why they chose this order, but we as a community have stuck with it. Also, let's go over how these enchantments and sagas work. Much like other enchantments, they are cast like a sorcery only on your two main faces. When the saga enters the battlefield, put a lore counter on it and do what the first lore block says. Then, after your draw step on subsequent turns, you add another lore counter and do the subsequent block. Kamigawa Neon Dynasty has some unique sagas because each saga has the same third lore box that says, Exile this saga, then return it to the battlefield transformed under your control. Transforming it means flipping it to the backside of the card. On the backside of each saga, you will find an enchantment creature special to that saga. First up, in white, we have the Restoration of Nganho. This is a two and a white rare enchantment. When it ETB, search your library for a basic planes card reveal it put it into your hand then shuffle the big issue mono white has been having for years is keeping up with the mana ramp most others can do wizards has promised that they are working on fixing this issue for the last year or longer now and have been slowly rolling out cards like this to give white a bit of a helping hand waiting for turn three ramp hurts a bit but it's still better than nothing the second lord counter states you may discard a card when you do return target permanent card with mana value two or less from the graveyard to the battlefield tapped on turn four it's not uncommon for white to already have some low value creatures in the graveyard after all white in general gives mono red or run for its money in aggro depending on how the game played out this lore counter might just rot on the battlefield but i think more often than not it will get used then like all these on the third lore counter exile and transform it it transforms into architect of restoration this is a 3-4 enchantment creature fox monk with vigilance Whenever Architect of Restoration attacks or blocks, create a 1-1 colorless spirit creature token. On turn 5, when this comes out, as a 3-4 with Vigilance might not be good enough for the current meta, especially with how powerful Kamigawa is turning out to be. Not being able to attack till turn 6, it's hard to swallow, so let's move on to the next one. The next saga is Michiko's Reign of Truth. This saga costs 1 and a white. For the first two lore counters, it says, target creature gets plus 1 plus 1 until end of turn for each artifact and or enchantment you control. This has the depend potential to be one of the better sagas however if it's played on curve it will be at best a plus one plus one for the first and second lore counter that wouldn't be horrible if they stayed around but because it's only till end of turn this is not great once transformed you get Portrait of Michiko. This is a 0-0 enchantment creature, human noble. Portrait of Michiko gets plus one, plus one for each artifact and or enchantment you control. So again, on curve, this is at best going to be a 4-4 beater. With no keywords, this card needs to be in an archive and enchantment deck and played mid to late game. With all of these stipulations in mind, a very commonly played card in Commander is Vandal Blast. That really hoses this card. The next saga is the Fall of Lord Kanda. When the saga ETBs, exile target creature and opponent controls with mana value value 4 or greater. This is an iconic white action to target big bad creatures. Like the saga before this, on curve, the chances of turn 3 4 power creatures is very low. The second lore counter says each player gains control of all permanents they own. On its face, this seems to be basically useless, however, in a format like Commander where curses get thrown around like candy, I can see using this to bounce a curse back onto the person who cast it. There is also some shenanigans to be had with things that normally get passed around the table. When this card transforms forms, you get Fragment of Conda. Fragment of Conda is a 1-3 enchantment creature, human noble with defender. When Fragment of Conda dies, draw a card. The only thing I can say about this is at 3 toughness, just go ahead and block anything thrown at you to get it to die and draw the card. The next card is Befriending the Moss. When it ETBs, target creature you control gets plus one, plus one, and gains flying until end of turn. This is good with a Samurai's deck who wants to use a single Samurai or Warrior attacking to get boosts off of all the other Samurais, and it needs to get in for damage. For lore counter two, repeat it. Once this card transforms, you get Imperial Moth. This is a 2-4 enchantment creature insect with flying, nothing else. And that is a huge blow to this card. The backside doesn't really synergize with the front, and honestly, I don't have much more to say about this. The last saga we have in white is Era of Enlightenment for one and a white. 
when it ETBs scry too. Scrying is cool and every once in a while it's useful, but oftentimes it's a waste of energy. On the second Lord counter, you gain two life. This is very vanilla, but at least it's something. Then, when this card transforms, you get Hand of Enlightenment. This is a 2-2 with first strike. If it's on curve, this is a 2-2 on turn four that can't attack till turn five. That just plain and simple is not good enough for nearly any meta or format. That wraps up the white sagas. Let's move on to the blue sagas. Our first blue saga is Inventive Iteration for three and a blue. When it ETBs, return up to one target creature or planeswalker to its owner's hand. This can be useful, but at four CM MC, this better pick up the pace. On lore counter 2, return an artifact card from your graveyard to your hand. If you can't, draw a card. Oftentimes, this will be draw a card, but I can see running this as a pseudo artifact protect. Basically, this negates an artifact removal spell or gives card advantage. Then, when it transforms, you get living breakthrough. This is a 3-3 fire enchantment creature, Moonfolk, that says, whenever you cast a spell, your opponents can't cast spells with the same mana value as that spell until your next turn. That line of text is amazing. If you have any idea what your opponent's curve looks like and what cards they might play, playing a 2 or 3 CMC spell locks out most spot removal spells. This is awesome and timed well because if this saga is played on curve, Living Breakthrough will be hitting the battlefield at turn 6. This is often when multiple cheaper spells will be played in a single turn while waiting to cast their bombs. For Mono Blue Control, it doesn't get much better than this. Being able to advance a board state, tempo out the opponents, and still have mana up to protect it on turn 6 is amazing. Let's keep going with the next blue saga. Behold the unspeakable. This costs 3 in a blue blue. When it ETBs, creatures you don't control get minus 2, minus 0 until your next turn. On turn 5, this is okay for mono blue tempo decks. They're still trying to keep their opponents at bay until they stabilize their mana base. On lower counter 2, you get, if you have one or fewer cards in hand, draw 4 cards. Otherwise, scry 2, then draw 2. For blue, getting cards in hand is key to any control strategy. The best way to beat blue control Control is to out card advantage them and play through their counters and other controlling mechanics. Being able to play cards knowing that your hand is going to be refilled is really nice. When Behold the Unspeakable transforms, you get Vision of the Unspeakable. This is a 0 0 enchantment creature spirit with flying and trample. Vision of the Unspeakable gets plus one plus one for each card in hand. This can be very good for any blue cards that say you have no maximum hand size and other card advantage cards. The main downside is if you can't keep the cards in hand, Vision of the Unspeakable becomes very weak. We have seen things like this with Warden Kaiman's Planeswalker from the AFR set. He makes a 0-0 spirit dog token with the same text about cards in hand. I think this is a good inclusion in a deck with Warden Kaiman. The last blue saga we have is the Modern Age, costing just one and a blue. When it ETBs, draw a card, then discard a card. Repeat this for the second lore counter. Being able to filter cards isn't the worst, but if you have all the gas in hand, then draw into more gas. This is a real feel bad. When the Modern Age transforms, you get Vector Glider. This is a 2-3 enchantment creature spirit with flying. On its face, I want to say this is absolutely horrible. If we take into account the front side, playing this on curve, you filter two cards. On turn four, you have a chump blocker for flyers. That doesn't sound too bad for Mono Blue, whose main win con is to get the right cards in hand, lots of mana on the battlefield, then control the game till a bomb is playable. This is a good way to get you into the late game. Most of the time, Blue is using turn two for one of two things. Either hold up counter spell or to foretell a card. Holding up a counter spell on turn two is just not a cost effective way to spend your mana. Even if you counter something, at best it will be a 3 CMC card that is likely not worth the trade and an opponent is trying to bait you into the counter. Foretelling can be good, but setting up to filter the right cards into your hand and have a blocker when it matters is way better. So I think this will see play. That's it for the blue sagas. Before we hop into the black sagas, please take a second to hit that like button just below the movie. And if you're enjoying it, hit that subscribe button. Let's get back into it with the Black Sagas. First up, we have Tribute of Harabi for one and a black. When Tribute ETBs, each opponent creates a 1-1 one, one black rat creature token. This repeats for the second lore counter. The front side does not sound like it's a card you want to play. Giving your opponent's creatures that they can attack you with or sacrifice seems like a bad idea. However, when it transforms, you get Echoes of Death's Whale. Echo is a 3-3 enchantment creature spirit with flying and haste. When Echo of Death's 
Death's Whale enters the battlefield, gain control of all rat tokens. Whenever Echo of Death's Whale attacks, you may sacrifice another creature. If you do, draw a card. The back side of this card is awesome. Having a turn 4 flyer with haste at 3-3 three, three, that sacks a token rat to draw you a card is really good. In a format like Commander, this gets even better because you will be getting back up to 6 rat tokens when it transforms. This card is a gamble card. Playing against the wrong opponents could be very bad, so I see this as a sideboard option in best of 3. Once you see what they are playing, you can decide they have a way to use the tokens. If they don't, this is really good. The second Black Saga we have is Life of Toshiro Umazawa for 1 and a black. When it ETBs, choose 1. Target creature gets plus 2, plus 2 until end of turn. Target creature gets minus 1, minus 1 until end of turn. Or you gain two life. Then repeat this for the second lore counter. Each one has its advantages, but telegraphing what you're planning to do by plus twoing one of your creatures makes it prime for removal. Minus one a Toski is always fun though. I think I'm going to be using the gain two life more often than the other two options. When transformed, you get Memory of Toshiro. This is a 2-3 enchantment creature human samurai. Memory of Toshiro has an activated ability of tap, pay one life, add a black. Spend this mana only to cast an instant or sorcery. This saga came out early before I could see how it would fit into the rest of the set. This is an auto include in a samurai deck because you don't really want to attack with it. You want to attack with a single samurai that is decked out with all the cool buffs provided by attacking alone. Then when something in combat happens that they buff the blocker to kill the samurai, you can tap him, pay the life, and cast spot removal at instant speed partially paid for with the one black mana he produced. Next, we have the coolest saga from black, the long reach of night. This saga costs three and a black, and when it ETBs, each opponent sacrifices a creature unless they discard a card. Then, repeat on the second lore counter. No matter how this plays out, it's good for you. They discard a card on turn four, that's likely not a cheap spell sitting in their hand. Or, you get to remove one of their creatures. The third option is you force them to cast an enchantment, removal, or counter spell. Either way, you're getting some kind of card advantage. When the long reach of night transforms, you get Animus of Night's Reach. This is a 0-4 enchantment creature spirit with menace. Whenever Animus of Night's Reach attacks, get plus X plus zero until end of turn, where X is the number of creatures in defending player's graveyard. While this can be a definitely powerful creature with menace, graveyard hate will hose it. Against an aristocrats deck, it's pretty good though. This isn't the most outside the box card, but I find it surprisingly refreshing to see your opponent's graveyard matter to you for a change and encourage others to start playing hate against their own graveyard. The final card for black is Akiba Reckoner Raid, costing only a single black mana. By a long shot, the cheapest saga we have seen yet when it ETBs, each opponent loses one life and you gain one life. Repeat this for the second lower counter. For a single black pip on turn one to put a life pressure on your opponent is really cool. It's not super powerful, but taking 10% of their life by turn two is more pressure than most people realize. When it transforms, you get Nazumi Road Captain. This is a 2-2 enchantment creature rat rogue with menace and vehicles you control have menace. Like I said in previous videos, the vehicle deck is coming to magic and it's going to be really good. This rat is going to make it a good bit better. Making the vehicles that are already a handful to try to work around as an opponent into a nightmare of damage that will close the game quickly, it's also basically negates the fact that you have to pilot them by tapping down other creatures. Menace makes it like you're attacking with both. That's it for black and we are halfway through through the sagas. Next, let's get into the red sagas. First, we have a return of a favorite, Fable of Mirror Breaker for two and a red. When it ETBs, create a 2-2 red goblin shaman creature token with whenever a creature attacks, create a treasure token. Mono red is definitely going to be a thing again for this set. The second lore counter says you may discard up to two cards. If you do, draw that many cards. This is a rummage effect and normally I'm not keen on it, but in goblins, being able to get rid of a top deck land or an end game card not needed can can be really useful when you're trying to be as aggro as mono red is. When it transforms, you get Reflection of Kiki Jiki. This is a 2 2 enchantment creature, Goblin Shaman, with pay one and tap. Create a token that's a copy of another target non legendary creature you control except it has haste. Sacrifice it at the beginning of the next end step. If you are one of the lucky few who have not had the pleasure of playing against Kiki Jiki Mirror Breaker, this sounds really powerful. 
but to the rest of us, we see that this is a very fair version of it. The pay one is what differentiates this from OG Kiki. If I had a deck with Kiki in it, I would consider putting this card in its place in the playgroup if they hate to play against Kiki. Next, we have Kumano faces Kakazan for a single red mana. When it ETBs, Kumano faces Kakazana deals one damage to each opponent for each Planeswalker they control. This just sounds terrible. On curve, there's no way anyone has a Planeswalker. And if you have an opponent with a planeswalker out, pinging for one isn't going to be your best move. When the second lore counter activates, it says, when you cast your next creature spell this turn, creatures enter the battlefield with an additional plus one plus one counter on it. This is also not very good. I guess if you really don't have any turn one plays, this is better than nothing, but I don't want to waste this, the card slot for this. When it transforms, you get Etching of Kumano. This is a 2-2 enchantment creature, Human Shaman with haste. If a creature dealt damage this turn by a source you control would die, exile it instead. A turn three 2-2 two, two with haste isn't the worst, but that exile text might as well be more flavor text 99% of the time. This card is just very underwhelming. The last red saga we have is the Shattered States Era for 4 and a red. When it ETBs, gain control of target creature until end of turn. Untap it. It gains haste until end of turn. This is fun to use against green decks with big beaters or creatures that get things when they attack. On the second lore counter, creatures you control get plus 1, plus 0 until end of turn. This is aimed at the mono red aggro decks wanting to swing in every turn. Then, when this transforms, you get Nameless Conqueror. He is a 3-3 enchantment creature human samurai with trample and haste. That's it. If played on curve, you don't get this 3-3 with haste and trample till turn 7. That's a terrible return on investment, and no more discussion is really needed. Now let's talk about the biggest group of sagas, green. First up, it's Bozeju reaches skyward for three and a green. When it ETBs, search your library for up to two basic forest cards. Reveal them, put them into your hand, and then shuffle. This is great. Green has a lot of options in its four CMC slot, but this is good if you're trying to ramp to the moon. Around turn four is when lands start to dry up in hand. Being able to keep them in hand to play on curve is vital in green. On the second lore counter, put up to one target land card from your graveyard on top of your library. In standard, this is paired well with land cards like Field of Ruin and Creature lands. When you are less worried about sacrificing a land either to remove some troublesome creature land or to lose a creature land in combat, in eternal formats this is even better for fetch land. When this transforms, you get Branch of Bosiju, a 0-0 enchantment creature plant with reach. Branch of Bosiju gets plus one plus one for each land you control. We have seen this many different times, for example Renin 7 and Druid class from AFR. They are always great and they scale with your lands. Next we have Jugan Defends the Temple. For two and a green, when Jugan ETBs, create a 1-1 green human monk creature token with tap, add one green mana. Getting a mana dork is always good. On the second lore counter, put a 1-1 counter on each up to two target creatures. Then, when this transforms, you get Remnant of Rising Star. This is a 2-2 enchantment creature dragon spirit with flying. Whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, you may pay X. When you do, put X 1-1 counters on that creature. As long as you control 5 or more modified creatures, Remnant of Rising Star gets plus 5 plus 5 and has trample. Getting to 5 creatures with some kind of modification on them in the current meta and in green to boot is not going to be hard. So this more often than not is going to be a 7-7 seven, seven flample beast. I really like this card. The best part is it scales in the late game when mana is not a constraining factor. You can dump a bunch of mana into a creature you cast and make it huge. Let's take a look at the next one. Teachings of Kirin for one and a green. When it ETBs, mill three cards. Create a 1-1 colorless spirit creature token. Self mill is definitely a strategy, so in the right deck, the first step isn't too bad. On the second lore counter, put a plus one plus one on target creature you control. This is a very vanilla modification, but modification is modification. Then, when this transforms, you get Kirin touched Orochi. This en enchantment creature snake monk is a 1-1 with whenever Kirin touched Orochi attacks, choose one. Exile target creature from a graveyard. When you do, create a 1-1 colorless spirit creature token. Or, exile target non-creature card from graveyard. When you do, put a 1-1 counter on target creature you control. Pairing this with the previous saga would work well as they help modify creatures to make remnant bigger. Alright, we're halfway through green. 
Next, we have Dragon Kami Reborn for two and a green. When it ETBs, you gain two life. Look at the top three cards of your library, exile one of them face down with a hatching counter on it. Then put the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. Repeat this for the second counter. You will see why this matters in just a sec. When it transforms, you get Dragon Kami Egg. This is a 1-1 enchantment creature egg with whenever Dragon Kami Egg or a dragon you control dies, you may cast a creature spell from among cards you own in exile with hatching counters on them without paying its mana cost. This card is really good as dragons are normally lightning rods for removal. And if this is paired with something like mana form Hellkite, you're going to get those cards out quick. And if you're lucky, this could bring out some crazy expensive creatures. The next saga is Azusa's Many Journeys for one and a green. When it ETBs, you may play an additional land this turn. On lore counter two, you gain three life. Both of these are cool, but they're not overly powerful. So let's check the backside. When it transforms, you get Likeness of the Seeker. This is a 3-3 enchantment creature human monk with when Likeness of Seeker becomes blocked, untap up to three lands. I find this really cool and if played with cards like Wolfpack Leader, it would be very useful to draw a card off the leader and untap the mana to play that card. The last saga in green we have is Tales of Master Shizuro for four and a green. When it ETBs, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature or vehicle you control. It gains vigilance until end of turn. Repeat the process for the second lore counter. When it transforms, you get Shizuro Living Legacy. This is a five five enchanted creature snake warrior with vigilance and haste. I'm really glad that they have this with haste because Spending 5 mana and waiting 2 more turns just to have to wait to be able to attack would be brutal. Finally, we're done with green. Let's check out the last two sagas that are multicolored. The first multicolored saga is Hidetsugu Consumes All for 1 and a black red. When it ETBs, destroy each non-land permanent with mana value 1 or less. This is a token wipe for 3 CMC. Right there, it's worth its weight. Then, on the second lore counter, you get Exile All Graveyards. Super powerful in Commander, especially if something like Jeweled Lotus or Soul Ring got wiped from the first lore counter. When this bad boy transforms, you get Vessel of the All Consuming. This is a 3-3 enchantment creature Org Shaman with Trample. Whenever Vessel of the All Consuming deals damage put a 1-1 counter on it whenever vessel of all consuming deals damage to a player if it dealt 10 or more damage to that player this turn they lose the game okay so hear me out blizzard brawl blizzard brawl again you will be at 7-7 already if you had something like a ranger class to put a plus one plus one on it etc it's really easy to get to those 10 fast the last saga in this set is the kami war for one and Wooberg. When it ETBs, exile target non-land permanent and opponent controls. This is amazing if you can get the mana together to cast it, but wow is it expensive. In Commander, this is a political card through and through. Then, when the second lore counter hits, return up to one target non-land permanent to its owner's hand, then each opponent discards a card. More politics here because people know that this bounce spell is coming, so they will be jockeying to save their stuff. When it transforms, you get Okagachi Made Manifest. This is a 6 6 enchantment creature dragon spirit with Flample and its all colors. When Okagachi Made Manifest attacks, Defending player chooses a non-land card in your graveyard. Return that card to your hand. Okagachi made manifest gets plus X plus zero until end of turn, where X is the mana value of that card. This is expensive, but man, can this be huge, especially with some kind of graveyard hate where you can clear your own graveyard and then cast a single big spell. So there's only one choice to give back a big old six or more mana spell that turns your dragon spirit into a 12-12 flample game ender. On top of that, you can cast that six mana spell again. Casting this card is going to be hard, like all Uber cards. When you cast this, it is more than going to be worth it. All right, guys, after a long night of review and pondering, we have a list. So let's get into the rankings. Starting out at number 23 is The Modern Age. This is just bad, so let's move on. At number 22, we have Era of Enlightenment. This on its face isn't horrible, but it just doesn't do much and therefore goes almost at the bottom of the list. At number 22 is Befriending the Moss. This is another do so little, it's not worth casting, so let's keep moving. Coming in at number 20 is Tale of Master Shizero. Costing 5 CMC to get 
two plus one plus one counters over two turns then a 5-5 five, five Vigilance and Haste backside just is far too much to pay and will never yield a positive return on investment. At number 19, we have Kumano faces Kakazin. Its cost is awesome, but its counters are very narrow, and if you wait to a point where the counters matter, the backside is useless. At number 18, we have Life of Toshiro Umazawa. I like the utility of the lore counters, but this is always going to be a sideboard card at best, so I'm going to have to keep it low on the ranking. The cost is right and the activated ability is good but it's just missing the pizzazz needed to get higher at number 17 we have Muchiko's reign of truth this card scales in importance depending on artifacts you control therefore it can be played at nearly any point in the game it would be better if there was a way to protect the artifacts built into this card but with threats like vandal blast this card is very susceptible to getting hosed keeping it near the bottom of the list on to number 16 the fall of lord conda sadly this is considered pretty good in the white sagas but honestly I'm just looking to get the first lore counter and then get rid of the backside as quickly as possible to draw them. if I flip a curse or something back with a second lore counter cool but it's not the reason I'm playing it next we have number 15 the restoration of Ingunho. this is a white weenie special card and if you're not running white weenie then don't even bother with it number 14 the shattered states era this is an aggro deck delight however it's not coming into the battlefield till turn 5 puts it much lower on the list this does lead to the chances of borrowing a big creature but the point of aggro is to get in early and hard before the bigs come out if it costs two or three cmc then this would be a very strong card coming in at the unlucky number 13 teaching of kieran green always needs a way to graveyard hate and this isn't the worst way to do it with the backside the self mill in green isn't awesome though this card would be much better if it was draw three than discard two at number 12 spot we have akiba reckoner raid I really like this card, and used in the right decks, this can be really fun. However, with no way to beef out the backside, it's going to need some build around. But I am happy with the fact that I am able to burn two and gain two from a single black mana. At number 11, Behold the Unspeakable. This is a cool card and does help blue needing to keep a full hand of spells, but costing five to start and not being able to attack till turn eight, this just isn't going to cut it. The card in hand combat trick is cool, but if you have to spend your counter spell, in hand to protect it then it really becomes less appealing before we get into the top 10 if you haven't already please hit the like button simply for the amount of effort I've put into this video if you actually like what you have seen so far please consider subscribing this helps me get to the first 1,000 subs that I've been craving number 10 is tribute to Harabi so this one may be a bit controversial because of how I've bashed on similar cars just a few minutes ago however this one is a turn 4 flyer with haste it's a 3-3 and you get a bunch of rat tokens and draw a card as you sack them the appropriate costing landed this here but it won't make it any higher because its timing must be in the early game on to number nine azusa's many journeys this just barely made it into the top 10 because it helps a ramp and can untap lands when blocked this is super powerful at only two cmc the gain life is just a bit of icing on the cake at number eight we have boseju reaches skyward at four cmc this fetches two basics then pulls any land card from the graveyard and gives gives you a creature that grows with your land count. What's not to love? At number 7 is one of my favorite, the Long Reach of Night. Getting card advantage or eliminating creatures for two turns is awesome. Then punishing the graveyard player with the backside is even more fun. It does get hosed by graveyard hate, so that's why I'm only made it number 7. At number 6 sits the best blue saga, Inventive Iteration. Costing 4 CMC is rough, but bouncing something one turn, bringing an artifact back from the graveyard or drawing a card the next turn then being able to lock your opponents out of casting spells of a certain value for the rest of the game essentially is really really powerful i wish it could go higher but we've got some powerhouses for the top five coming in at number five we have dragon kami reborn i understand that it can be a bit situational and in standard that this can get significantly worse but like tibble's trickery when it works holy cow does it work cheating out a nearly uncastable 13 cmc creature for 
free or whatever other shenanigans you can come up with this is just awesome at number four just missing the medals is the best green saga jugan defends the temple the cost to get a mana dork some one ones and then a likely seven seven flample as well as boosting your creatures on cast with extra mana lying around puts this three cmc saga firmly in the fourth place alrighty guys coming in at number three taking home the bronze is the Kami War. I get it, it's very expensive and hard to cast, and it's not meant to be played on curve. This is meant to put a really hard three turn clock on your opponent and make it harder for them while watching the clock tick away. There are only two cards better than this in the sagas, and I can guarantee I will get a lot of hate for number two. Coming in at second place, taking the silver medal is Fable of the Mirror Breaker. This is a fair kiki jiki in standard, and if people don't find a way to break it, then shame on them. The potential for this is almost as high as the original, but it's actually fair and not another infinite combo that is going to get banned. Lastly, for all the marbles, taking home the gold in first place in Kamigawa Neon Dynasty Sagas is the Mythic Saga in Rakdos. Hidesugu consumes all. This is a three mana powerhouse that will absolutely blow the doors off your opponent and make them lose the game. This sounds like a win to me. I understand it dies to removal, but so does nearly everything else. This, however, is lower costed than most of the rest of these sagas and does so much. Thank you guys so much for watching this review and rankings of the Kamigawa Neon Dynasty sagas. If you liked what you saw today, don't forget to let me know by hitting that like button. And if you would like to see more, let me know in the comments below by hitting that subscribe button. As always, take care, be kind, and God bless.